Welcome to Shovel Talk, a podcast for economic developers. From your friends at the Golden Shovel Agency. All right, Happy New Year and welcome to our second season of Shovel Talk. We were renewed for a second season, so that is exciting. We are going to kick off our first episode of 2022 with our usual. So where in the world are you, Amanda? Hi, Darren. Thank you. I am in... Northern California. <laughs> so back home, I came home for the holidays, got here uh, just before Christmas. And um, I'm actually really excited because my next location is Minnesota. So I'll be coming out for the EDM conference. And I haven't been to an economic development conference in a number of years. So I'm really, really excited to, to head over there and meet some of our clients and meet you and some of the uh, rest of the team. You know, we've been working together for a couple of years and, and haven't met yet. So I'm very excited to come out. Uh, yeah. And then I am, I actually do have my next location out of, out of the country chosen and booked. I'll be heading back out March 3rd. So we'll have to see on uh, maybe the next podcast where I am. Well, thank you, Amanda. And let's kick off our podcast. We're going to start 2022 uh, by keeping things in house. I want to welcome Greg Colby Orenson, Place VR executive producer here at Golden Shovel. He's going to tell us a little bit about the metaverse. He's also going to tell us a lot about his uh, great and unique background. And also, if anybody on this uh, on this podcast listening has ever worked with him, he is just a joy. So, welcome Greg to the podcast, and let's kick things off. So, Greg, we heard that you worked on a reality TV show prior to getting into economic development. Tell us a little more. What was this show all about? <laughs> well, yes, I've worked, on, I've worked on several projects, many of which have been pilots for TV shows. That's uh, how most shows get started. The show concept is pitched, and then a, a pilot, if it's green-lighted, the pilot's produced with a budget, and then it's pitched to the network. I don't believe it went any farther than being pitched to the network, but yes, I helped produce and direct a reality show. It was a home improvement show back in, oh gosh, <laughs> early 2000s with Aaron Brissois, our CEO, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> so you were in at like the forefront of home improvement shows, I feel like. <laughs> Was that before they got big? I don't remember. <laughs> well, it was definitely, yes, this, Joanna and uh, the games hadn't been on air yet, but uh, I, uh, I guess I'd consider that they, they followed in my footsteps, but they made it happen. <laughs> You're a trailblazer, Greg. Yes. You know it. Oh, I blazed a few trails, but uh, sometimes in the wrong direction. Don't we all? <laughs> so let's dive into your background a little bit. Tell us about your background as a video producer. Well, um, I think. My story is probably not terribly unique, but uh, it started off as a kid. I love cinema. I love movies. I was uh, an early kid of Disney, Bedknobs and Broomsticks and the Apple Dumpling Gang. So now I'm going to really date, date myself because you guys probably have never even heard of those. I didn't understand most of that sentence. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, Kurt Russell, strongest man in the world. Um, wow. So as a young person, I was influenced with cinema and I started making eight millimeter movies. And I love the production, the scripting, and trying to figure out how to tell a story. No matter what medium you're using, all you're doing is communicating a story to an audience. And I was doing that as, as a young kid. I was also building models and uh, using firecrackers to explode the models in our action thrillers and slow motion. So I had a lot of fun doing that and uh, just kind of flexing my creative muscle. I ended up going to St. Cloud State, and uh, after some soul searching, I knew I knew that I wanted to be in some type of communication. So I did transfer some from St. Cloud State, Minnesota. Uh, it's in Minnesota to uh, University of Miami and Coral Gables, and they actually had a Bachelor of Science Communications degree that was being offered for the first time. And I believe I was one of six to first have a combined broadcast communications along with film production, hybrid degree. And then they also had me double major in uh, photography and uh, art history. So I got, I got really immersed, if you will, in my education with that. And my, I guess my first professional gig was pretty funny. It was a motorized surfboard called the Surf Jet. And uh, it, was a, it was a short ad at a water ski school that I was teaching at. 
they were renting these surfboards. And so I said, Hey, I can, I could record a commercial for you. And I think I got paid probably a hundred bucks. And I had to split that with my uh, business partner at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was it, w- it was the first time that uh, I was actually paid. And so I, I guess I became a professional <laughs> right before I graduated <laughs> college. But then uh, I ended up working through networking when I moved back to Minneapolis from Florida after graduating. I got on a CBS movie of the week, which was a real eye opener. It was what I was the, the basically the, the track that I was hoping to go uh, and follow after school. Um, it was a CBS movie of the week called The Stranger Within, and it starred Ricky Schroeder and Kate Jackson. And uh, it was a real eye opener and a foot into entertainment. And uh, there's a lot of production going on in Minneapolis and Minnesota itself. We had uh, some tax incentives called Snowbait. And at the time, we had a lot, a lot of high profile films being shot in the state. So it was a exciting time to be, I guess, a storyteller or communicator back in the early 90s. From there, I ended up through a network and internships and volunteering. I ended up uh, in some corporate video and landed a job with Nordic Track, the athletic uh, equipment manufacturer, and uh, started started a corporate career. I had hadn't been taught about corporate communications or business. And I now wish that I had had business classes in college, but my eyes were open to all the needs that uh, business needed uh, to communicate through that visual medium. So I uh, worked from there, ended up through various other jobs, working through production companies and uh, ended up owning my own production company for 12 years I sold that to an agency in Minneapolis and uh, hooked up with Aaron Brassois several years later. And here I am working with Golden Shovel. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. (laughs) Wow. Sounds like a really diverse background and um, some really interesting projects that you were able to work on. So that's awesome. Well, it beats digging ditches, they say. And uh, (laughs) (laughs) I've seen a lot. The unique part of what I've been able to do is I've, I've, Met so many interesting people from professional talent to uh, corporate clients to travel and the subject matters, everything. So I've gotten to see behind the curtain in a lot of in a lot of my work. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, we actually have a lot of questions for you about some of those experiences, Greg. Uh oh. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. So we might as well just dive right in. So who was the funniest person you ever got to shoot with? You know, in economic development, I'll just go to my Golden Shovel experience as of late. I've been working with Golden Shovel for four years, and I would say I love all of my client contacts. We become fast friends. They're economic developers as a whole. These folks are well-respected, well-liked in their community, and they're just a lot of fun. One person that I that just bubbles to the top is uh, Chuck Sexton from Kentucky, and uh, not only does he use voices, <laughs> and uh, he has a good singing voice too. He's got he good. Does. Singing. He does. He's. I've heard him sing. He he enjoys Monty Python. He does a, a really good English accent. So from going from his Kentucky accent to a British, it's it's a lot of fun. But yeah, he's uh, plus he likes bourbon. So uh, he educated me on what Kentucky has to offer there. Well, that probably definitely made the shoot more interesting. Absolutely. <laughs> I heard he has a really, really good lion voice. A lion voice? Heard him sing- yeah, he, we had him on the podcast uh, a while back. And yeah, he, uh, he did the... Cowardly uh, Lion and the Wizard Cowardly- of Oz. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> he has an acting background. Oh, does he? I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah, oh, that would man. make sense. So you would like if I was king of the forest. They would be- uh, <laughs> yeah. So if you haven't heard that podcast, listeners, you should go check it out. It's definitely worth the re-listen. After we record this, I'm, I'm going to click the link. Uh, so what's the uh, most adventurous shot you've ever gotten? Oh, the most adventurous <laughs> shot. Well, we see a lot of things from industry to environmental to uh, beautiful scenes to tremendous vantage points. A lot of what I do is, uh, as I tell the story, it's the perspective, it's the best vantage point that I can give the the viewer to immerse them in what 
we're doing is a virtual 360 video. I would say climbing a 140 foot water tower in York, Nebraska was probably my most adventurous and probably the most dangerous. Don't tell my mom. Uh, <laughs> she wouldn't be happy. Well, I guess she knows about this now. So. Did you climb it with no, like no brace, no harness, nothing, just straight up climb it? Well, yeah, I, <laughs> I was in with a safety harness, but there was one key piece that connected the harness to, <laughs> to the ladder that was missing. So I had to, I had to climb all 140 feet. <laughs> oh my goodness. Tightened into this, uh, this whole, uh, apparatus that was doing me no good, but I was with a, uh, retired lineman and, uh, we had seven, there were several tiers to a water, water tower. Um, I never realized what a water tower would look like inside but it's quite interesting and scary. <laughs> there was the last 75 feet was a straight ladder and um, the water tower, well, it contained water and it was drippy and wet inside so that uh, the ladder happened to be wet at the same time. And uh, so it made, uh, made for an interesting uh, afternoon for sure. <laughs> So you don't have a fear of heights, I guess, I'm assuming. <laughs> well, um, well, we'll say this. I got a respect. <laughs> I have a respect for heights. <laughs> ah, <there we> <laughs> As all should. <laughs> and, and yes, I, I was scared. <laughs> but, you know, we, we got the shot and uh, we've used that shot in, um, in demo pieces. Client's been very, very happy. We were safe. The, the group I was with experienced people. Uh, now we have a drone that we're using and deploying, so that really helps take that uh, fear factor out of out of it because I never leave the ground. But it, it's been fun. So I think a uh, note to all of our listeners: Greg will do things for the crazy shot. Cool spot in your community. Greg will find a way to shoot it. <laughs> I don't know if I should be scared of that, or uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know. I think I want more fun stories on our weekly meetings. So you guys need to book some more VR videos so Greg can have some adventures to share with us. I second that. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> okay, tell us about a time you got lost. Well, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, so I won't <laughs> mention Warren Westcott's name. <laughs> but he and I, I've had, I've had the pleasure of traveling with Warren on several projects. And one of them was uh, Eastern Oregon for a client we really love working for. And we've made several trips out there. And we flew into Boise and then had about a two hour, three hour ride to uh, get to our location for the evening. And it was probably about midnight, kind of rolling in on fumes in the rental car. And <laughs> we realized that uh, we had inputted the wrong town into the GPS. Uh, it was the next day's uh, location. And so this part of the country, towns are 30, to, 30 minutes to 60 minutes to an hour and a half between each other through the mountains. So we had another, I, I don't know, hour and a half drive after traveling. We rolled in at about three o'clock just to get up uh, super early in the morning <laughs> to meet our client, but we did it. So I guess we were pseudo lost. It was more wrong choice of uh, GPS input. Yeah, you can't always trust the GPS. No. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> so again, you'll edit Warren's name out, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, absolutely. hundred percent. I'm not saying that he was the one that, that inputted into the GPS. <laughs> into our phones, <laughs> but I'm just saying. Love you, Warren. <laughs> so tell us about a shot that you never thought you could get, but did end up getting in the end. As I mentioned earlier, perspective is everything. Not every city has its vista view, its overall. Here is our community with a beautiful shot. Sometimes it's uh, relatively flat. So we've, uh, we've incorporated work with the drone on a commercial level. And uh, I've been trying to figure out how I could mount a 360 camera to the belly of this drone so that upwards of 400 feet, I could get a perspective of any site-specific industrial land, community, overview shot, beautiful shot, um, something that takes the danger out of climbing water, water towers. <laughs> and I was able to do that through uh, a lot of experiments and hardware store runs. So I've, I've got that now. I'm really excited to be using it on more projects. Tell us about an animal encounter. I mean, there's definitely has to be a time that you got chased by a dog or bit by a snake or something. 
I don't have a lot of fear of much, but I will say poisonous snakes would probably make that short list. And uh, I've been shooting a lot for anywhere from uh, as far south as Arkansas. I've shot down in Panama, in Haiti, some international projects, and then to the west. And one, one common animal there that all these southern states, especially western southern states in America, were rattlesnakes. So I just pulled the trigger a few months ago and actually bought myself some cowboy boots, some proper Texas cowboy boots so that I can wear them uh, at work. I never run into a snake. I'm usually told after the fact that, uh, yes, these water moccasins, these rattlesnakes, these very, very poisonous snakes, and we're out usually out in the country away from any medical care. They usually like water. Um, I'm usually the one in shorts with uh, hiking boots, walking around the rivers, that type of thing. And I'm told this after the shoot. So uh, no more. I, I will say that I came across a rattlesnake skin and I actually did jump three or four feet into the air because it was on top of mine. But no, I, I have not been chased by dogs or uh, lions, tigers, bears, or anything. I think for that, we may have to go to Amanda. She's had more exotic oh, animal gosh. encounters than you. <laughs> I have some monkeys on my mind right now. Tell monkeys. me about the monkeys. Oh gosh. I When I was in Kenya, um, I was staying in an eco lodge and we, uh, well, the, the eco lodge didn't have covered windows, um, big windows, but they were, they had wooden, there's basically pieces of wood across uh, the windows with six inch gaps between each, uh, each log, I guess it is. And yeah, there was little, the little monkeys all over the place. They called them ninja monkeys because they like to steal stuff. They'd get into the rooms. Uh, they were actually like bu- uh, bunk beds in the rooms and with mosquito nets over it. So they'd like to go in and play and slide down the mosquito nets and, and then they'd steal your stuff. So they, they stole uh, an eight, three months worth of melatonin and were surprisingly, <laughs> surprisingly back the next day, <laughs> not sleeping. <laughs> and yeah, they, they uh, threw one of the other guy's laptops outside. They stole other kinds of medication uh, anything they thought was food or had food in it, uh, they would they would get into. So I actually kept my suitcase next to my bed with all my electronics plugged in the wall and then in my suitcase. And I'd zip the suitcase up when I was gone so that everything would stay in there <laughs> and they couldn't they couldn't get the suitcase outside. So that was my solution to that. And I've had other encounters. I actually ran into a moose in Wyoming at um, uh, one of the national parks there. Yeah, I didn't get too close to a bear, but did did see a bear in uh, Montana. I've I've had a number of animal encounters. Wow, I, I the only encounter I had with monkeys was uh, recently in Panama, and uh, we were in a jungle, and I saw some howler monkeys about a hundred yards away, and I felt pretty mm-hmm. lucky and amazed. But nobody uh, took my melatonin. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Yeah, I have done the the like baby sea turtles. Like I was actually on a sea turtle conservation project in Costa Rica. I got to see them sloths, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> we should do an animal related podcast one time. <laughs> all right, let's get back to let's see what's the best food or meal that you've had while filming while you've been in some of these uh, exciting locations that you've gotten to travel to. Hands down, Buffalo, Wyoming, which is Johnson County, and where uh, they shot Longmire. I had an elk elk steak that uh, was absolutely to die for. I had a very generous client who took me to dinner, and I think that steak was 50, 60 bucks. <laughs> it was like my mouth is starting to water right now. It was by far the most amazing steak I've ever had. Nice. So was it after a long day of filming? Because I feel like after after a long day, especially if you're out, you know, working up your appetite that meal after that day is just the best <laughs> you know it it absolutely was and I know when I was recently in Panama we had shot all day and it was a lot of long long hours on the road as, as well and um and they actually I actually drove the rental car uh, I was just completely beat we had Korean barbecue mm. and um I had never experienced I, I I I won't say I'm a foodie but I really do enjoy um, trying new things. And uh, I had never done the Korean barbecue. And one thing that I noticed um, and discovered in Panama was pork bellies, it's, which is basically just 
the best bacon you've ever had mm-hmm. in your life. <laughs> and yep. it will probably kill you um, if you have, <laughs> have it more than two days in a row. But I, I actually, I did. I, I should say maybe it's three days in a row. But I had that Korean barbecue and um, uh, I had some pork belly. It was just amazing. Just have amazing. you have you ever had any like the adventurous stuff that when you've been in like other countries like grasshoppers yeah. or any of that? I have. I've traveled to, uh, to China. Uh, I've had uh, fish head soup, turtle, uh, cockroach larva, uh, minnows, fried minnows. <laughs> yeah. Oh my! <laughs> uh, leg of leg of lamb, and it was the whole leg. Um, oh my goodness! Yeah, there. Were... Did you finish it? I could only <laughs> the, the leg of lamb. No, no, I mean what they did was they they served it to the entire table, so Got you would it. just. <laughs> like a whole leg of lamb to yourself <laughs> no yeah <laughs> wow greg <laughs> i would say the fish head soup was pro- i had maybe i like fish a lot but that w- when when i stirred the soup and a fish fish head popped up and looked at me that's kind of when i went yeah, yeah. maybe yeah. i'll just do the broth <laughs> yeah <that's too> much. <laughs> yeah i saw that for the first time in kenya where it was just a whole fish on a plate and i'm like mm. <laughs> know if if this is for me (laughs) yeah um yeah it's usually the exotic you know the exotic travel like in haiti um we had whole fish and they would just take the whole fish and just uh, barbecue it basically yeah Um, yeah it's uh (laughs) i i remember once in china we went to what looked and appeared to be a pet store an aquarium and um we picked out (laughs) what we wanted oh no and they put it in a little bag and it was squirming around. And then um, we went to the restaurant and we gave the little bag to the uh, waiter. And mm. then uh, 12 minutes later, um, it was served and it was delicious. I wish I could remember oh. what it was, but it's probably a little poor, a little octopus. I don't know. <laughs> well, it was certainly fresh. It yeah. Was fresh. <laughs> yeah. All right. So Greg, I think all of us agree that we would be quite, um, quite happy to go out on shoots with you because they are, sound like a lot of fun. But we definitely want to tell our readers a little bit more about what that means. Um, you know, your day job now is Golden Shovel Place VR producer. But most people don't know what Place VR is or the type of work that you do with 360 video. So give our readers, the our listeners, excuse me, the, the summary. Fill us in. Well, Place VR, I guess best definition is a, a division of uh, Golden Shovel Agency. Uh, primarily, uh, 100% of the work and content is um, economic development. We do shoot tradition. My background's traditionally been, you know, for <clears throat> 30 some years, been traditional video. So standard video that you'd shoot and see on your television at home. 360 VR, I'm sure that a lot of people are familiar with it, and especially if they have kids in the gaming industry, a gaming industry really jump-started this whole 360 immersive uh, experience. But what it is basically is we use a camera that continues to evolve and get better at a higher resolution. We're shooting in 5.2K or five times that of HD quality. This camera has actually two separate cameras inside and it records 360 degrees around and up and down. So basically what we do is we process that content or that video that we record in 360 and the viewer can put on, uh, for example, Oculus goggles, VR goggles, and be transported to that environment or to the scene where we shot that, that video. And we've got three-dimensional stereoscopic spatial audio now. Basically, it means if somebody's to your left and would be talking, you'd hear, hear them in your left ear. You would turn to look at them and you'd hear their voice through both ears. Or if a car was passing to your right, you'd hear it in your right ear. This is where the technology is going. And basically what's happening is it's transporting the viewer to the environment and tricking the brain, thinking that you're actually immersed in that environment and actually transported to the scene. In the world of economic development, it's really been a time and cost saver. Let's say a site selector would like to go visit a community. They would normally need to jump on an airplane, fly out, get a hotel room, taxi, Uber, whatnot, 
wined and dined, and then um, spent several days and then head back. Here, a site selector could be mailed the goggles for the cost of postage, um, put the goggles on once they've arrived, and uh, take a video tour of a community and never see as much as we produce in that video in person. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. So Greg, you know, VR has been around for a little while, but I think this, you know, this metaverse term is kind of fairly new. So do you know where the metaverse term came from and how is it different from VR? Does it just encompass VR, but also include other things? Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Well, the, the, the metaverse is really evolving now. Um, I am by no means an expert. And I, I would say a lot of people aren't an expert in the metaverse yet. What does it mean? I know uh, Facebook just changed their uh, corporate name to, to Meta. It's been confusing. It's basically, as I understand, it's defining itself now, but really it's the overlap of physical and digital worlds through virtual reality and augmented reality. And basically, it's embodying the internet. So I, I would say, from what I understand, it's really where the internet is going, and it's how we will interact and experience the internet. And I actually did not put two and two together with Facebook's new name being Meta. Didn't even occur to me. <laughs> So maybe looking at some examples of you know, VR and the metaverse, how can economic developers use video, especially virtual reality, um, to make their jobs easier? Well, that's a really good question. And I, I think that we're defining the use of the metaverse as we go and as it evolves. But I, I would think the low-hanging answer to that would be the remote worker, especially with COVID. I think that the largest impact is going to be the workplace environment. And we are currently redefining what that means, but it's how we interact and uh, react with other coworkers within a virtual environment. So for example, we have developed at Golden Shovel, a virtual conference room where people anywhere in the world can meet. And what we've developed now with the technology that we're using, we can interact with props, with documents. We can actually use video, play video, start, stop, pause together in a room without having to be in that same room. So I think that that's just scratching the surface of what we can do now with the metaverse. And uh, I'm really excited to see where we're going. It's fascinating. So people could actually like do a presentation within a virtual conference room. Absolutely. In our Absolutely. world, it will be economic development would be um, here. Let's show up show you more about our community, our workforce attraction our, you know, our, the incentives that we have, our infrastructure. It's truly amazing. So Greg, you're talking about this virtual meeting space, a virtual conference room that Golden Shovel has created. Obviously, because of COVID, a lot of us are meeting virtually anyway, using solutions like Zoom. So what is the difference or advantage to a 360 conference room space versus what people are used to on Zoom? It's going to uh, provide you the same experience as if you were actually there. When you're a participant in one of these meetings, you actually forget that you're wearing the goggles. The brain is so immersed in the content and what's around you that you, you literally lose yourself. You get used to the graphics quite quickly, and it becomes the content to which you're talking about that rises to the top and is the most important piece. Humans are very, very uh, adaptive to this technology. That's why it's so exciting. Yeah, it, you really are fooling the brain. You feel like you're in person with the others around the table or where you are. And we're able to move around the room. We have presentation tools. We can watch a video. But you can actually stand in the middle of a 360 video and look up and down and around. And you're actually there as well. Numbers are limited right now to uh, four or five participants. Someday, very, very, very soon, we'll all be meeting with our goggles and virtually in person. So basically what you're saying is that the difference between this virtual meeting space that Golden Shell has created and a Zoom is that you actually feel more immersed in the meeting, like you're truly participating versus just observing like you do with your screen. Is that accurate? Absolutely. 
it's the subtleties around you that you start to experience. And it just basically makes it so much more realistic. I'm taking this, this recording right now in the kitchen. And so I'm distracted by, I, I'm lucky enough to live on a lake. So I'm looking at a frozen lake right now. I'm also looking at the dishes that I need to do. Those are the things that are distracting me from this interview. However, when you're in a virtual space, all the visual stimulus is coming through and you're not distracted by anything other than being in that room with others. I think that's really interesting because anyone who's had Zoom meetings, uh, especially these last two years with COVID, I think would have to admit there are times where you're on a Zoom meeting and you do maybe check out a little bit, you do get a little bit distracted, your attention maybe drifts elsewhere, and it sounds like this solves that problem. Now, obviously, this is aligned with what you create for our clients. So do you feel like the same holds true with a 360 video versus just watching a traditional video yep, on YouTube? Absolutely. It's the same thing. If you're sitting in a conference room or watching a video at the airport on your laptop, you've got all this other stuff that's going on distracting you. When you're wearing the goggles, you are absolutely immersed in the content. And that's the most important thing. When you're trying to get, as I said, basically, it doesn't matter if you're shooting traditional or 360 spherical video, it's connecting a message to your audience. You're going to do that completely with the virtual experience versus a traditional way of, of viewing the content. One thing that you had, had, had mentioned when you're in these meetings, you're also seeing the other participants. And when you actually turn to look at the person, they can turn back and look at you. So when you're on a Zoom meeting, yes, you can, uh, you can mute your camera and your audio and go pour yourself another cup of coffee. In this case, it's a lot harder to do that. You really are a participant in that meeting. <laughs> but I will say the benefit is you still don't need to wear pants. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what he means is he can stay in his casual shorts. <laughs> there you go, casual shorts. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so what do people actually look like in the VR video or how, how much capability is there to edit what you look like? Well, right now we're using avatars and as if you were to be playing a video game, you pick your hairstyle that uh, from a, a number of subset hairstyles and facial hair and maybe sunglasses, the uh, wardrobe that you're wearing, the shirt, the color of the shirt, that type of thing to create your avatar. What's happening now is uh, we're actually using photography. So you could have your face, your photo imprinted right over your avatar. What's going to be really, really exciting is when, when we're able to connect facial expressions, eyebrows, cheeks, smile, mouth, that type of thing um, in a realistic way, we'll, we'll get there. And we're, we're really on the cusp of um, uh, making that even more realistic. The whole gaming industry is, is what's leading the way. So if there is an argument for video games, it's uh, that they really are creating this technology that eventually is used in business and commerce. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. So uh, can you give us some examples of your work and how economic developers are leveraging what you've created? A lot of what I do is produce content and then I deliver it to our team or the client directly. I do know that it's being well-received because I continue to get more and more work. They're voting with confidence and, and, and we're producing more and more work every day. One example, I think this is a really unique example, is Shelby County, Kentucky. Uh, Libby Adams is using this virtual technology to retain high school students from moving from the area once they've graduated. So what she and her team did was they teamed up with a technical school to produce a video that could be shown to prospective graduates and try to keep them in the area. So we had four other industries that are really looking for some good young talent and they'd like them to stay in the area and they showcase their business, what they did, their manufacturing process. We shot cool robotic arms doing welding and technical things, really, really high profile products that were being produced from these, these factories. 
and basically give them a, a real in-depth inside look at uh, the opportunities that their area and the industry within their area had to provide. And so she has had a lot of, as I understand, well-received responses to this. And it's all about, again, community and building the community and telling these young adults that, hey, we've got a lot of opportunities in our area. Take a look and consider staying here because we've got the jobs and you can create an amazing life and career here in your hometown. Wow, that's a really awesome way to use virtual reality. That's, that's one I hadn't heard before. All right, so we are going to go into our shovel toss game. So Greg, are you ready for 10 questions? You'll answer as quick as you can. I have no idea if I'm ready, so. <laughs> All right, let's dive in. What's the last book you read? Uh, it was The Shining by Stephen King back in 1983, <laughs> I think it was. Awesome. <laughs> uh, your favorite podcast? Uh, Shovel Talk, of course. <laughs> okay, I was going to say that better be your answer. <laughs> Let's go second favorite podcast. Oh, gosh. I can't, I, I you know, there's just so many. I, I have a real hard time picking the, my second favorite. All right. Uh, what's the first thing that you do in the morning? Uh, make coffee. <laughs> what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were a kid? Pilot. Favorite superhero and why? I'm kind of superheroed out, but I would have to say that at least the first film of Captain America, I was pretty impressed with. Superheroed out? Why? Too many Marvel movies? Yeah, I'm not a comic guy. I'm sorry, DC. Oh, or man. <laughs> but, but Captain America was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what superpower would you want and why? I would want to fly. Then I wouldn't have to uh, worry about flying a drone. I could just carry the camera. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, if you could live anywhere in the world for a year, where would you live? Norway. If you could have a meal with anyone in history, who would it be with and why? Elizabeth Shue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't even know who that is. <laughs> I think my reasoning is obvious. She's a beautiful actress, Amanda. <laughs> um, favorite band or singer when you were a teenager? Tears for Fears. Well, is this next question is going to be a doozy then. If your most embarrassing hairstyle or article of clothing from your childhood. I used to be in a garage band. I played guitar and I had, do you know who John Belushi is? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was on SNL and uh, he played okay. this ninja restauranteur. And basically he had his hair up in a, like uh, maybe like a little toddler girl would wear uh, with her hair straight up in a bunchy or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's how I would wear my hair. And I also had green hair in the front when we wore our hair long and the, like our bangs were really long and it was shaved in the back. Yeah, that's uh... <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Greg, for playing this uh, shovel toss game with us and being such a good sport. Those are great answers. <laughs> and thanks for being on the podcast today and teaching us a little bit about the metaverse and VR. Well, it was a delight, and I, I really am flattered uh, for being asked, so uh, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Another big thanks to Greg Colby Orenson, Place VR Executive Producer here at Golden Shovel. Upcoming Golden Shovel news, we do have a Workforce Shortages ebook that should be dropping in your inbox anytime soon. It might be already there by the time you listen to this podcast. Um, we are also having a webinar that's going to um, coincide with that called Understanding Workforce Shortages and How Communities Are Building Their Talent Pipeline. That is going to happen on February 10th. Please make sure to register for that at the Golden Shovel website. As far as Golden Shovel on social media, please like us at Shovel Toss. Please follow us at Gold Shovel and also follow us on LinkedIn at Golden Shovel. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Golden Shovel Agency. Thanks again to Greg. It was great to get to know him a little bit more. One thing about working um, at a virtual company is sometimes you don't really get to know the personal side of some of the people you work with over Zoom all the time. It was nice to listen to his background and get to know Greg a little bit more. We will see you in February on our next episode of Shovel Talk.